morning and uh, welcome to this new uh, try at the Vibrant Seminar. I hope this is going to be as successful as the last one. And I'm very glad to say that our first speaker is Igor Sparlinski from University of New South Wales, Sydney. And he's going to speak on maximal operators and restriction bounds on Viosumps. Please, Igor. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. I always like your seminar. And finally, I'm in the time zone, I can extend it without breaking my sleep. Uh, so we'll be talking about some recent results on viral sums. And actually, I already see a typo on the first slide. Uh, yeah, one of the co-authors who joined us recently is missing. It's Julia Brandes. So should be joined work with Roger Baker, Julia Brandes, and Chen Gao Chen. Uh, okay. So let me start with setting up the notation. Uh, I will be denoting by T sub D the T dimensional unit torus. And then for a vector U on this torus, I define the while sum uh, using this uh, uh, standard notation for the exponential function E of X. So it's a sum of exponentials of a polynomial in N with coefficients which are controlled by my vector U. Uh, and N runs between one and capital N. And the sums are named after Helen Weil, who introduced and investigated the sums. And he actually managed to uh, foresaw the great value for mathematics. And it was more than 100 years ago. And actually, has two concrete examples of the usefulness of the sums. Uh, uh, Helen Weil established the uniformity of distribution, model one of the fractional paths of uh, values of real polynomials. That was his first result. And a little bit later, he obtained probably even a more important result. He obtained the first subconvexity bound on the Riemann that theta function, which was first non-trivial uh, result of the Lindelof hypothesis. And of course, in that time, uh, the floodgate of applications have been uh, opened and kind of over flooded. Uh, so uh, here is a very incomplete list of possible applications. You see that. Uh, many bounds on the zero free region of the zeta function depend on our knowledge and control of the of the wild sums. And of course, as a result, uh, the kind of the most refined knowledge we have so far in towards the prime number theorem comes from these bounds. Uh, this is something important for the wiring problem and for many other applications. I don't want to talk much about this, but what is really surprising is that recently Erdogan and Shakan found links to uh, to the theory of partial differential equations. And I will mention this a little bit later. A very surprising unexpected application of while sums. Okay, so let me just start with a short summary of what we know about the while sums. And of course, let's start with something very simple, namely trivially by the possible identity, if you integrate over the whole torus, integrate this, uh, the sum with the square, you know the exact value is n. So it comes for free, but of course gives us absolutely nothing. Well, it's not quite true. It kind of indicates the average size of the sum should be square root of n, but this applies to essentially any exponential sums of this type. So to get more information, you would like to look at higher moments. Uh, and uh, it makes sense to look at positive uh, moments with uh, which actually are odd, uh, sorry, even integers. So the moments will be of this type 2s, where s runs from two because s equals one is a trivial case. So s is two, three, and so on. And this game is very non-trivial, provided that s exceeds d, the degree of my polynomial, the dimension of my problem. Uh, and d is really a crucial point because if d is, if S is less equal D, then there is a reasonable elementary method of Mordell, which gives you uh, a precise value of this moment. By the way, just in case uh, you forgot the definition of the sums SD, they in the uh, in the footer of my slides. So there are some other uh, notation in the footer, but they're not relevant uh, yet. So for now, just let's look at S sub D. So this will be always with us. Instead of putting my name or the tit uh, title of the talk, I decided it would be more useful to put the, some basic definitions. 
So we are now, now interested in higher moments and more specifically for S, which are uh, bigger than D. And results of this type are known as a collective name, Avinagradov's mean value theorems. I use plural because there are several results here of different type. So it's better to use plural here, I guess. And we call them Vinogradov's mean value theorem because Vinogradov himself was the first who obtained the first non trivial bounds on these moments, J sub Ds of n. And in fact, with the right saving. But what wasn't, wasn't right in his uh, result is the value of S for which this happens. So he obtained a right bound, but for only for very large values of S, larger than you would like to, uh, to have it. Nevertheless, he linked his bounds on average to pointwise bounds on the sums and obtained a very strong uh, estimate on the sums, which substantially improved the previous results of uh, Weil and uh, Van der Kolk, at least when the degree D is large. Well, since that time, uh, after works of Vinogradov himself, he improved his own results several times, reducing the bound of S on S, which this is true. So Lin, Nikolov, Kratsuba, uh, uh, Ford, Won, Wuli, uh, many other people. So 85 years and several dozen papers later, we finally have uh, the dream estimate, uh, which is due to Burgain, Demeter, and Goods, and to Wuli, and it was obtained during this three years, which says that for S, which is too free and so on, uh, you have an upper and lower bounds, which are of the same order of magnitude. And actually, the lower bound has been known for many years. It's, it's a very easy bound. So only the upper bound here is, is really important and really new. And the upper bound says that this quantity is bounded by the maximum of the sum, which makes no difference, of course, in this game, by n to the s. And n to the s is responsible for diagonal solutions of the system of equations, which you'll see later. And n to the 2s minus d times d plus one over two. And this kind of in charge for the randomness of uh, polynomial values. So I will try to explain the meaning of this two terms a bit later, but for now, just believe me, this is what, uh, what should really be here because we have a matching for about. And you see there are two groups of authors here. And this is because first Woolley obtained this result for d equals three. As you see, even d equals three is already non-trivial. D equals two is easy. D equals three is already very hard if you want this bound. And uh, we gain Demeter and Goods obtained a result for d, which, uh, for d greater or equal four. And actually their method doesn't work for d equals three. So it was a perfect match of these two techniques. And a little bit later, Wooley improved his method and managed to also recover the result meaning he extended his method to any D. And in fact, he obtained a more general result for exponential sums with linear combinations of polynomials. And this will be something which we'll um, uh, discuss a little bit later. In fact, this bound looks like very uh, cluttered. Uh, it's not difficult to see that uh, the only estimate which we really need to have this uh, bound in this form is a bound for only one critical value of S, namely for S, which is D times D plus one over two, which is called the critical value. So the convexity estimates will reduce everything to, to this particular value of S. And this is how these results uh, have been proven only for this value of S. But again, it's kind of a remark which is not very important for the rest, but just to help you to understand the uh, general uh, picture. Okay, that was about average bounds. Now let's look at pointwise bounds. Namely, we have vector u, which controls our polynomial, and we want to estimate our sum as d sub u, uh, as sub d of u of n. So if we use the Vinogradov's method, Vinogradov's method of 1935, and plug in the optimal uh, version of the Vinogradov's mean value theorem, you have the following result. Assume that we know a good rational approximation to one of the coefficients in our polynomials, to one of the values of ui, except that u1 is useless for us. It should be u2 or higher. So we know that u sub nu is approximated by a over q, 
is this area one over q squared. Then this exponential sum can be estimated in the following way. It's n to the one plus little over one. And let's ignore this little over one. So n is a trivial estimate because the sum is uh, S sub D is the sum of n exponential functions. Each of them is one by absolute value. So n is a trivial estimate. And whatever stays on the right of n is our saving. It's one we are doing better than the, uh, uh, trivial bound. And now you see, first of all, this is some exponent outside. But uh, if we have something which is less than one here, it won't hurt us too much. So Q minus one gives us no trouble. It's less than one. N to the minus one gives us no trouble. Actually, it's a very good term. But then we have Q times N to the minus new. So if Q is huge, of course, we are happy about this term, but this term will, will, uh, will become trivial. So there is kind of a trade-off between uh, the index new for which we have this approximation, the value of Q, and the total saving. So this is what we know. And unfortunately, we have no uh, feasible approaches to improve on Vinogradov's method and improve this bound. So despite that we have an optimal version of the Vinogradov's mean value theorem, individual bounds are not that good. And in fact, we expect that this exponent outside can be reduced to one over D, but we don't know how to do it. And it's also obvious that any result of this type, any non-trivial estimate on S, uh, S sub D of UN should depend on the Fountain approximations to nonlinear coefficients, U2, UD. Uh, for example, if they're all uh, integer numbers, then it's clear that you won't get anything. So it's kind of natural to expect that the condition of this type will be natural, uh, will, will, be, uh, will be necessary, but what we get out of this condition is what so it's what you can do nowadays, and we don't know how to do better. Okay. Uh, do you, sorry. Do yes. you know if you can do better if you suppose that two of the UIs have good approximation? Or? Uh, no, not really. There's no okay. any natural condition which will, which will allow you to, to lower this. You can extract this information. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So, Basically, what we know about, uh, about the wild sums can be summarized in these two statements. We have a um, complete knowledge of the average values, and we know something but very little about point-wise behavior. And the question which I will discuss uh, at the first part of my talk would be, can we interpolate between these types of results? And I will explain what this interpolate means. And in fact, this question leads to uh, studying uh, a notion which is well, very well known in functional analysis. And actually two notions. And these notions are called maximal operators and restriction bounds. In fact, when we started looking into this direction, we didn't know that what we were doing was uh, getting estimates on maximal operators for the wild sums. And I will explain it in a second what, what maximal operators are. So we will consider them as functions of U. Let me recall again the bound, the pointwise bound. It says that if you know something about u sub nu, then you know something about the sum s. We don't have to go into details now. This means that the bound depends on approximations to only one of nonlinear coefficients u2, u nu. And probably u d UD would be the best for us to choose because it maximizes the, uh, the power nu here. And this means that for almost all u sub d leading coefficients. And for all other coefficients, we can choose q to be about n, which is the best choice. And we have the following result. For almost all u d, u d, and then all other coefficients, we have this bound. So it's what, this is what you get if you substitute q, which is about n, into this estimate. So the point here is, that uh, we only need to put some restrictions on UD and we can take the maximum or all U1, UD minus one. Uh, again, I repeat the previous statements here. And this motivates my next question. Uh, this method was very naive, but can we do something better and get stronger statements? 
So what I'm uh, what I'm seeking is uh, a result of the following uh, shapes. So this is kind of a prototype theorem which I want to prove. I want to prove that for almost all components of my vector of coefficients u on prescribed k positions, the following follows. For all components on the remaining d minus k positions, and for all some lengths n, you have a bound whatever x, x, x you can show. So as you see here, k is one, and we do it only for the top position, but you can do for for other positions. D minus uh, k becomes d minus one, and our bound is here on the right hand side. But if you want to consider something more general, and actually it has been uh, studied with a chain of consecutive improvements by first Luminio and Forni, uh, then Trevor Woolley obtained the results to, towards this equation. And uh, a little bit later, Chen Gao Chen and I uh, obtained yet another uh, series of results. So let me just describe what we actually proved. And I want to introduce uh, more notations first. It's very convenient to generalize this question. Uh, so I consider a vector of d polynomials. I assume that they are linearly independent. Uh, and they, in fact, uh, the uh, linear independent is a constant polynomials, which means that no, uh, no linear combination of these polynomials give us uh, a constant, not necessarily zero, but just a constant. And of course, we have a vector of coefficients u. And then instead of sums s sub d, I define this sums t, define it by my vector of functions, phi 1, phi d, uh, taken with coefficients u1, u sub d. So you, you see, is this is a vector, not a set, because the order now matters to me. And just to relate it to the previous notation, if phi sub i of t is t to the i, it's exactly the classical while sums. Uh, S sub D U N. Now I do the following. I decompose my unit torus, d dimensional unit torus, into a direct product of two tau T sub K and T sub D minus K. And so my vector U will be split into concatenation of some vector X and some vector Y from these two tau. And instead of writing T, sub u, a t of u, I write t of x, y, just to show that you have two groups of coefficients. And as I already said, we emphasize, uh, it's important to remember that pi is a vector, not a set. So if you, in this classical case, if you permute t i's, you get a different equation with different sums. So the order matters to us. Okay. So, uh, following, this, uh, 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 following the works of these people, you're interested in bounds on these sums, which hold for almost all x and for all y. So alternatively, we can define finally my, uh, my, my basic object, object, maximum operator, on these sums. And we can say that I'm interested in bounds on maximal operators which take the last d minus k components, maximize my sums over all these choices of n, and ask what happens to this, uh, to this quantity for almost all values of x. So this is uh, how this equation can be now formulated. And why are we interested? So this is uh, my drawing, and I think it's the best I could reduce. So we expect that the set of large while sums is very sparse. So assume that these red dots indicate some clusters of large while sums, which means if you shoot at random in this uh, square, it's a two-dimensional picture, we are not likely to hit any of these red dots. But we want to know, to know more. We just don't shoot points here. We can shoot lines. And the previous question tells us if you have a good answer to this question, if you had good uh, bounds on this maximal operators, that if you allow just to shoot lines instead of points, you're still not likely to hit large uh, regions of large file sums. 
So this kind of uh, informal motivation, why these questions are interesting. They still tell us about the sparsity, extreme sparsity of the set of large vial sums. Okay, so as I said, uh, there are three groups of results. First, the Flaminian for knee. They obtained the result which was uh, 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 based on some methods of ergodic theory and was not very strong. So Trevor Woolley improved this. And uh, to show some quantitative results, I will need to introduce two more notions. First of all, <laughs> I will be uh, seeking bounds of this type n to the one half plus gamma. Of course, n to the one half must be here because uh, you don't expect more than square root cancellation. And of course, if you take gamma equals one half, it's a trivial bound. So if you want a bound where gamma is less than one half, it's kind of typographically nicer if you remove this uh, one half instead of just writing n to the gamma, it's easier to write n to the gamma, n to the one half plus gamma. Uh, now, the following parameter is also very important. It's the sum of the degrees of polynomials over which we, we maximize. So it's a degrees of polynomials with coefficients y1, yd to the minus k. So this kind of y part. Uh, it's a degree of non-freedom. It's for, for which we take all values of the vector, uh, vectors y. So it's the sum of degrees of those polynomials. Okay, in this notation, Trevor Woolley proved the following, that in the previous bound, in this bound, a kind of hypothetical bound, you can take uh, gamma, gamma sub w, w comes from Woolley, of this type. So the degrees of non-freedom, of course, hurt us, makes gamma higher, but then you still have some, some, some non-trivial range where you have non-trivial non bound. Uh, a little bit later, uh, Chen Gao Chen and I improved this result. And uh, essentially we subtracted one from here and two from here. And one can easily check that this exponent uh, is strictly less than uh, Woolley's ex exponent. And in fact, our result is always non-trivial meaning that this quantity is less than d times d plus one plus, uh, uh, d times d plus one divided by two. This is what you need to, so this to be non-trivial uh, in the classical case. So no matter how you, how you permute these polynomials, if you in the classical case, no matter what you fix, you still have a non-trivial bound. So it was good that this probably the most interesting, interesting case, you always had a non-trivial bound, on the other hand, there is another very interesting uh, case of binomial functions, and later we'll come back to this. So even uh, you have t and t to the m, two functions of the shape. In this case, this result fails. It does give you anything non-trivial. Uh, but we'll come back to this case later because it's a very important case. Okay, uh, now, As a simple and essentially trivial corollary of our result, we prove that if d is equal to d, if sorry, if k is equal to d, which means we don't have any supremum, we just interested in the bound which uh, holds for almost all u. Then in this case, you have the square uh, this desired square root cancellation. Uh, surprisingly enough, it wasn't. Uh, I don't want to say no one. It wasn't explicitly written anywhere. Uh, so I'm sure people knew this, about this result for many decades, but we could never find uh, uh, a proper reference. So in our case, it's a simple corollary of taking k equals d. Anyway, you have a square root cancellation, and it brings us to the following question. Uh, should we always expect the square root cancellation? Uh, so can we take gamma equals zero for a generic enough set of polynomials phi, for example, for this case? Not just when we take almost all values for all coefficients, but only for some. And we believe that this is false. And in fact, in some cases, we can prove that gamma should be as large as one quarter. So in some cases, you can't expect anything better than n to the three quarters here. 
which was a, a bit surprising. The uh, choices of functions which lead to uh, lead to very large sums, generically large sums. Okay. So as I said, the notion of maximal operators is very well known in functional analysis, and this is how they define it. If you have a function f of two variables x and y, then this operator maps this function to the function g of x, which takes the supremum of f over y. So, so far we discussed bounds on the, uh, uh, on the values of this operator for almost all x. But of course, you can also ask, uh, about other related questions, for example, about L, L norms and L row norms for different values of row. And actually, even row equals two is non trivial here anymore. And from now on, to simplify the discussion, I always assume that my uh, choice of functions is classical and, in fact, in the classical order. So, phi i is t to the i. Again, as you permute this, and you have the same set of functions, you change the equation, even if you don't change the set of functions, you change the vector of functions. So we will be looking at uh, these operators, m sub k on, cl on the classical wild sums. So what you proved here, it was joint uh, work with Roger Baker, Chen Gao Chen, and myself, that for any positive row which exceeds d to the k squared, uh, d, d squared plus 2d minus k, you have this both-sided bounds. And the most important thing is not the, how the bounds look like, but that they're the same. So we need an exact value up to little over the exponent for the L rho uh, norm of this operator. And this exponent looks kind of a bit exotic, but in fact, it's not, uh, because it has a nature interpretation. This exponent comes from the critical exp exponent in the Vinograd of mean value theorem, a very natural quantity to appear in equations of this type, plus the dimension of our degrees of non freedom, where we take soup, where we are not able to discard some values of the vector y, which we don't, don't like. And of course, by convexity, it immediately gives an upper bound for smaller values of rho. So, as before, this is kind of a new critical exponent. So this is what we establish there. Uh, and in fact, for d equals two, which is still a very non-trivial case, uh, even if you have only two uh, possibilities for, for only two uh, coefficients, x and y, dealing with the separator is not easy. Uh, and here I want to show you a very nice result of Roger Baker, who improved the previous result of Alex Barron. And he proved this both-sided inequalities uh, which are essentially of the same uh, order as our generic bound, except it gives precise values of the logarithm here. So here it's kind of not a pseudo match because here we have little over one. And there's still some, non, some gap which I ignored so far, but uh, Baker's result gives an exact order of magnitude, magnitude. It gives a power of n and a power of log n in this case. Well, now what we cannot do, uh, we don't know how to extend this for any value of d and control fully this no norms for any row greater or equals than one. We can get uh, uh, upper bounds by convexity, but they're not tight. So it would be very interesting to extend this method of Baker which covers the full range of row. You see, there is no prohibition here. It starts with one, uh, while in our case, it doesn't start from one. Uh, and uh, obtain these results, we don't know how to do it. Uh, and we, so this equation is still open. Now, uh, I already mentioned that in our work with Chang'o, we obtain it a bound, which, which is non-trivial for the classical choice of the function psi i when psi i of t was t to the i for all i's. But in important case of binomials, it wouldn't give us anything. So now I want to look at this specific case, except that I will modify it a little bit. 
So I want to introduce uh, the following uh, quantity, <coughs> omega m, which is the smallest possible value of theta, such that for any polynomial phi of t of degree m and any coefficient tau, real coefficient, for almost all x, this maximal operator is bounded by the to the theta. Uh, this sum looks very ugly, and no one, no one would ever look into these sums with this kind of strange combinations, uh, except that there are very nice applications of the sums. So we look at the sums not because uh, we want it, but because we have to. So this is exactly uh, the previous scenario of maximal operators. Uh, and for these sums, we have some bad news. None of the previous bounds works. So if you substitute uh, these parameters for sigma, which is the sum of degrees of non-freedom in our result with Chen Gaochen, you got nothing. And of course, other bounds are, are even weaker. But the good news is that the method works. So we can still readjust what we did for these sums. And uh, now let me explain why the sums uh, came to life. It's because the existence justifies by applications to some classical partial differential equations. And that was discovered by uh, Erdogan and Shakan in 2019. And they actually obtained uh, bounds on the sums as well, on the separators, sorry, not bounds, not sums. So motivated by this, uh, applications, they obtained the following bounds. Uh, this corresponds to basically using the same argument as I showed you at the very beginning when we uh, discussed Vinogradov's point-wise estimate. And they did the same, except that this is a bound uh, due to uh, Hergen Weil of Van der Kolkut, and this is a bound obtained uh, within the Vinogradov's method with the uh, mean value theorem due to Bourguin, uh, the meta goods and volume. So of course we wanted to do better uh, because again, it's a very naive approach. Uh, uh, our results do not apply as they are, but we managed to adjust the method. And what we obtained, it was the following estimate. So we proved that omega of m doesn't exceed one. Of course, it must be one minus something, otherwise everything is trivial. Divided by one, uh, the uh, minus one divided by two SM plus one. Where SM depends on some mean value theorems for binomials, not on the Vinogradov's mean value theorem, but for some modifications of it. And using what we can find in papers of all well, again, Woolley and some, uh, some other people, we can take uh, S M to be uh, the sequence of these numbers up to M equals 10. And then there is some kind of generic formula which tells you that M is uh, M times M minus one over two plus R of M. Now to compare this with the result, let's take a large value of M, then R of M can be ignored compared compare to this term. And you see that our result, because we have two S M and again, ignore one, will be about, uh, we'll have denominator of order m squared for a large value of m, where the denominator is 2m squared, twice uh, twice uh, li larger, so the whole quantity is tw uh, twice smaller, and this is our gain against the trivial. So we improve them by a factor of two for large values of m. And of course, we improve them for small values of m as well. Okay, so uh, this brings the equation. We know that this omega m, this quantity omega m, admits a non trivial estimate. But what's the truth here? And here we don't really know much. Can but you just recall... again... Sorry? Sorry, can you recall what omega m is? Omega m is the, okay, it's the best what we can say about this two parametric equation. We maximize y, take soup over y. Okay. The it's, M is the degree of phi, right? Yes, M is the degree of, of the polynomial. We want it for all polynomials M uniformly. Uh, tau is not so important. If you want to get a, if you see how to get a better result for tau equals one, it still would be good. So tau was kind of extra here, which we obtained it for free. But it's 
And the interesting thing is that you need phi of n, and phi of n shifted by, by a linear polynomial n. So this is uh, unchangeable for these applications. So uh, it was very surprising that uh, Julia Brentis, uh, St uh, Scott Parcel, I don't know the, uh, the name uh, of uh, uh, other people, I think George Shakan and of course Bob Wong, they obtained it, uh, a lower bound which was matching the upper bound and which gave them this exact uh, equalities that go, go, uh, omega 2 equals omega 3 equals 3 quarters. Well, I'm pretty sure that for uh, any physicist, it's enough to conjecture that omega m is 3 quarters, not even conjecture, probably proof. That, but uh, we still don't know this. But what we know, and this is a recent work with um, uh, Julia Brandes, we proved that it, it's at least three quarters. That for larger values of m, so no miracles happen, and the sum will remain to be large. And uh, of course, uh, it's nature to conjecture that omega m is three quarters, and we are still way far away from this. So for m equals four, uh, if you uh, check what we proved for omega m in uh, our work with uh, Chen Gao Chen, we got 16 17. It's a long way to go down to three quarters. So uh, certainly it's a very interesting open question. And it's also very interesting to see what happens if you take two nonlinear polynomials. For example, we have no information about these sums. It looks exactly the same as my sum for which omega m was defined, except I replace n with n squared, added a nonlinear term. Everything breaks down. We have no idea what we can say about these sums. It's possible we can get some non trivial upper bounds, but certainly not, uh, we don't know any lower bound. So we can rule out that omega m defined it for this family of polynomials would be one half. We don't believe it, but we can't disprove it. Okay, now, uh, uh, how much time do I have? Another, when do I have to finish? You have, I uh, guess, 20 minutes. So, how, many, how much? 20. Oh, 20, okay, good. Uh, thanks. So, now I move to a slightly different topic, uh, which is closely related to the previous discussion, and it's called restriction bounds. So assume that mu be a measure supported on some set V of our unit torus, such that it's normalized. So I want to look at mean value theorems with respect to this set and this measure. So the classical case would be then V is T sub D and mu is just a Lebesgue measure. That would be the classical Vinogradus mean value theorem. But we can look, some other, look at some other sets and some other measures. For example, the set V could be some algebraic variety, or it could be just some analytic curve or surface defined by some analytic functions. It could be some geometric structure, for example, linear space or intersection of several balls, whatever, or cubes. Uh, it could have some, could have some combinatorial structure. For example, it could be a set with a small subset. So just ch ch choose your favorite a subset of the unit torus, and you can ask this question, and these questions are interesting, meaningful, and hard. And it's also kind of clear that this, when the set V shrinks, when you can see the smaller and smaller sets in this unit torus, the equation becomes harder. And today, I won't concentrate on a very special case, on the case of small box. So V for me will be just a box, and the size will be the, of the same, it's essentially a cube because the size will be of the same length. And of course, it's clear when this box shrinks, we are essentially approaching the scenario of point wise bounds. So at some point, uh, uh, it should become very difficult. So, and this so, is what we want to investigate. Sorry. So when you say mu of V is one, that's just a normalization. You're not it's just normalization, yeah. Uh, you can okay, forget about mu. Uh, you can see always things that we integrate with respect to the back measure, 
and we just change the shape of, of the uh, set V. Okay, no, no, I got it. Because at first I thought there was you you're taking a, a set with full measure in the torus, but no, 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 no. This is a measure on this. It's normalized measure on V. No, V is a small set. The smaller the harder, basically. So we will be dealing with these boxes. And in fact, uh, the idea to look into this appeared uh, some time ago uh, because it was related to several other problems. And for example, in this work uh, with Chen, uh, Chen uh, Bryce Kerr and James Maynard, we uh, obtained this bound. It was a tool to prove something else. But there we needed to estimate only the fourth moment for, uh, for classical while sums or small boxes. And the bound we needed uh, would be of this type. Uh, if you forget that you integrate over a small box, then of course it's n squared. It ex exhibits a diagonal, diagonal behavior. But you integrate over a small box, and the volume of the box is delta to the d. So you expect if that if life is good to you, then you will get delta to the d n squared. And we almost got it except that there was another term. So the power of delta here is a bit smaller, which is, of course, against us because delta is less than one, but the power of n is smaller, which, is, which helps us. So there would be a value of delta when this term dominates and we have a bound of the right order of magnitude. And this is what we needed. And we use this result to show that uh, for almost all wild sums, you have exactly the square root consolation. So for the set of the back uh, full back measure, the, uh, the sums are cornered between uh, two multiples of n to the one half, all values of n. So there's no logs, no little over here, just the pure square root consolation. And some other bounds can be found in this work, and I will uh, discuss them a little bit. So. Uh, the first work in this direction was by Chen Gao Chen and myself. Then Demeter and Langowski improved what we did. And recently, uh, Chen Gao Chen, Julia Brandes, and I improved on Demeter and uh, Langowski. So, and uh, I, I don't want to discuss this improvements. We are, it's still developing. We are sure that we can do better, but we want to understand the full strength of what we can do. But we know what tools we are going to use because the tools here are very, very interesting. So as I say, as I said, this uh, work in progress. So I don't want to present any concrete results uh, because they may still evolve. But uh, I want to discuss two approaches which we use here because these approaches are, are very interesting. One, and they give us two types of results. We don't combine them. Maybe uh, one can combine and improve what we do. But right now we have two approaches and they work in different regions. In, in different regimes of uh, delta compared to n and d. So we use results of Roger Baker on the structure of large while sums. And we use uh, a very recent result on so-called in inhomogeneous Vinogradus mean value theory. And this is what I will discuss in a second. But let me start with the result of Baker. So Roger Baker uh, proved the following very nice result about the structure of large while sums. So we already discussed that uh, to, to have a chance to have an upper bound on, on while sums, you have to know something about the affine approximations. And essentially, uh, Roger proves that yes, and it's kind of necessary and a very natural condition. And he uh, described what happens if your sum is large. So if your sum exceeds some par parameter A, then you can describe what happens to rational approximations of the coefficients. Uh, in his result, A should be sufficiently large and bigger than this. And if you have uh, this inequality, the sum is large. This happens for a reason. It's because your coefficients can be well approximated simultaneously by rational numbers. Uh, and this is a range. This is the upper bounds on the denominator and this is the bounds on the precision. Again, I don't want to go into technical details. Of course, you can get it from the Baker paper, but it's a very nice, very powerful result. Uh, 
which we used. And we got a series of results, which is based on this. Uh, however, for in some regime of delta, we used a very different approach, which we called inhomogeneous Vinogradov's mean value theory. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, uh, the lower bound on the Vinogradov's integral, which we call J sub S D, comes from diagonal behavior of solutions. It's because this integral, which you want to estimate in Vinogradov's mean value theorem, is nothing else but the number of solutions to the system of equations. And of course, you can take x1 equals to x, uh, x sub s plus 1, x2 will be uh, equal to x s plus 2, and so on, and you get n to the s solutions. Uh, this is uh, why we have this term n to the s. So again, it's not the point now, but what is really important that is besides this solution, uh, this system, you can also look at a slightly different system, which typographically looks exactly as the previous one, except a shift uh, my right uh, hand size by hi for some integers i. Well, generally speaking, it's not a big deal because there is a very simple uh, trick which shows that if uh, uh, you have a bound on this, uh, on for this system of equations, you have exactly the same bound for homogeneous system of equations. So the number of solutions here uh, maximizes when hi is a zero. And sometimes it's enough, uh, it's enough, and most of the time it's enough. However, you can hope that if it's not zero, then you can kind of use this information and get a better bound. Because, for example, this diagonal contribution doesn't apply anymore. So this, this is not a solution anymore if, H, uh, if Hi's don't form a zero vector. And in fact, this question appeared in several uh, um, applications very recently. For example, uh, in a paper with Roger Baker, again, Mark Munch and myself, we wanted the result of this type. Uh, in our applications to the large CIF estimates or polynomial model. So uh, we wanted this result and we asked Julia Brandes whether she could prove it and she actually did. And then later she worked with uh, Kevin Hugh. And a little bit later, Trevor Woolley improved on the result and obtained it as bound, which is stronger than a direct ap application of, of the Vinograd of mean value theory, the a direct application of what we know for this homogeneous system. Uh, well, disappointingly enough, uh, their bounds are still not strong enough to help us. Uh, this, uh, with, with their bounds, we, still, we would still lose to other methods, so we couldn't apply them here, but we applied it in our project on restriction uh, theorems. Anyway, as I said, the bounds, they are non-trivial. They are better than the direct application of the Vinogradov's mean value theorem for the homogeneous system. But the truth is not clear yet. We don't even know what to expect. What should be uh, an optimal bound in this case? I think it's a very interesting problem to investigate. And now let me just quickly mention a few uh, possible generalizations and extensions. Uh, <clears throat> so I think it's very interesting to understand fully the class of uh, polynomial vectors for which we can obtain non-trivial bounds on maximal iterators, and actually also understand whether we always have at least three quarters in this game as a lower bound. So we need some good versions of the Vinogradov's mean value theorem with our vectors phi. And one of the interesting examples uh, is provided by Bourguin. So for this biquadratic family of polynomials, he has this bound. Uh, it's probably not optimal. In fact, it's certainly not optimal, but it can already be used to, uh, to gain some information for this interesting set of polynomials. Uh, I'm not saying this problem is very difficult. I'm, I give an example of the problem as a possible entry point for someone who wants to do something new, interesting, and yet uh, certainly doable. So it's kind of a warm up question for anyone who, would, uh, who is interested in this area. Uh, uh, probably a deeper question 
is to understand what are even correct analogs for uh, sums, for multiple sums. It's not even clear how to formulate the result here. Uh, there are some uh, versions of the Vinogradov's mean value theorem in this case, as dimensional case, but they're not in the same generality as in the one dimensional case. Many other tools are also missing. So this generalization will not be straightforward. And I'm not even talking about uh, obtaining kappa bounds. Even formulating the equation itself is not immediately uh, kind of straightforward here. Uh, well, now, if you remember why uh, while sums were introduced, uh, you probably uh, uh, immediately ask yourself, what about the discrepancy? What about the uniformity of distribution? Well, sums are very nice, but we don't need them as such. We want to say something meaningful about, say, fractional parts of polynomials. And here you can also consider analogs of what we have done for, for the discrepancy. I, uh, I remind you that the discrepancy of a sequence of points gamma n, the, the dimensional torus, is the largest deviation between the number of these points inside of a uh, rectangular box B, rectangular with, uh, with uh, size aligned to the size of the torus, and the expectation. And the expectation, of course, is a volume times the number of the points. So it's the largest error in our prediction of many points should be in a given box. And then you can do the same you, as before. You take a vector of polynomials. You take a vector of coefficients u1, ud from the unit torus. And you consider discrepancy of these points u1 phi 1n, ud phi dn. So it gives you a d-dimensional vector. And again, you can split u into two parts, x and y, define d of x, y instead of d of u, and start asking, Questions of the same type. What's the, what's the behavior of the maximal operator on the discrepancy? For example, what can we say on average uh, about the values of the supremum? So we are asking about this L rho norm of this uh, of the values of this operator. Uh, it's kind of clear what to. Uh, what to do? First, we need the cox mathews inequality. Then we express D via uh, certain ex uh, linear combinations of while sums with different coefficients. So the previous method should work, but there will be some modifications and adjustments, and I don't even know uh, how to predict the result. Perhaps the results will be the same strengths, but I'm not completely sure. Uh, so it's a very interesting. Uh, direction of research to obtain good results for the discrepancy. And I think it brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I was very happy to give this talk for your seminar. And please, questions and, of course, answers if you have it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Lot of results. <laughs> um, so let me, I guess, let me open for questions. Uh, everybody's favorite. Yeah, I do have a question. I'm curious about uh, the applications you mentioned for the Schrodinger equation and KDV equations. If you, if you can say some words well, about that. Uh, okay. Uh, I use it kind of in a black book fashion, but I can tell you what they try to do. Uh, they have a solution which is two-dimensional kind of uh, function and look on the fractal dimension along straight lines from the origin so they want to see what happens to the fractal dimension of the solution and okay. it, it, it's uh, and they reduce uh, this equation to bounds on this maximal operators Oh, so, and this function phi, is, does it have like a specific form with, or they want it for generic phi? Uh, for them, I think it's just a power. It depends on the uh, equation. For classical equations, mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just a quadratic polynomial, cubic polynomial. But if you modify yeah. the equation, I think it comes from the right hand, uh, from the, sorry, from the boundary condition on your equation. When you have, oh, the, it comes uh, directly from your equation. Uh, I see. 
I think classical cases, they require monomials, but you can consider probably any function there. Mm -hmm. But the fact that phi is a monomial does make it any easier. And, and, and this omega m mm -hmm. that we're trying to estimate, is this related with the fractal dimension? That's yes, exactly. Is. Yeah, yeah, there okay. is a, yeah. It's not exactly this, but it, there, there is a close link. It's basically, you, you calculate the fractal dimension in terms of omega. Oh, let's see. I missed the beginning of the talk because I was taken with my subway. Uh, but uh, I'm very surprised about this three quarter. Um, uh, I, I would have understood that uh, it's not one half, but then it should increase with M. Mm -hmm. But then it's the three quarter uniform. Oh, uh, well, we, we, we don't know. Well, we, we know that yes. the quarters for M equals two and three. As I said, yes. for any physicist, it would be enough to claim that yes, of course. <laughs> Yes, but do, do, do you have any any uh, heuristic why it should be three quarter? Uh, we know we understand the low bound why it's at least three quarters. This is what we this we understand why it's uh, why the upper bound should be three quarters. No, I cannot explain it. Okay. I, I I just don't know. Maybe maybe it's not. It's very hard to even run numerical experiments here because okay. you talk about almost all. It's yes. all in almost all. So we don't know how to verify it numerically. Is, is the proof for D equals, so M equals, what's the variable there? Is M two and three. The, yeah. Uh, are the proofs very different for two and three or they're like? Uh, no, they're similar. Okay. So the, okay. Because I thought there would but be they, like they a degree work, of... But they don't work for higher values of M. They break down. Uh, I see. Yeah. They certainly tried. Of course. <laughs> and, and this this lower bound three quarters uh, is it, this just comes from like like finding a specific fee or is uh, well what is, I can explain why three quarters. You can see the basic rational sums is denominator p. The p is a prime number. It's more or less enough because you can approximate very, uh, every point very well is point with denominator P. Actually, Duff and Schaff already knew this. Now it follows from the, the, the conjecture, but for this specific case, even Duff and Schaff already proves this. So uh -huh. you can see the sums of lengths N uh, where the coefficients are of size one over P. And for, uh, say, let's, let's take M equals two when we talk about Gaussian sums. You know that Gaussian sum, the square, square root of P on the full period, and at most square root of P was incomplete sums. Mm -hmm. So you take N, which is not P, but a multiple of P. So you have several complete sums plus one incomplete sum. And you want to make sure that the incomplete sums dominate, but they can't dominate too much, otherwise introduce much, uh, a little bit of noise. So basically this is how you balance it. You create large sums out of Gaussian sums. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we did for, for uh, with Julia, we managed to extend this argument for any value of M. We proved that there are always large rational exponential sums. So if you take exponential sums mod P, there are enough sums uh, with, uh, uh, of size square root of P. At least, of course, you know at most by the by by, uh, by the way bound. I mean, and the way, but we also need a low bound, which is square root of p. So we play the same game. We create a long sum, which is actually a repetition of uh, several of, of the same rational sum, which is large. So the 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 local square root of n philosophy goes against the global square root of n philosophy. So, so say, uh, say it again. The local square root of n philosophy, yes. which built by every Gauss short Gauss sum, goes mm -hmm. against global uh, yes. square root yes. of n. Yes, yes, exactly, yes, yep. Uh, 
So three quarters, roughly, you have to balance n over p and p to the one half. This is more or less why you have p to the three quarters. This is how you choose p and uh, say assuming that uh, sums would not be they would not admit square root cancellation would be something else p to the two thirds. It's kind of fun. then it would change three quarters to some other rational number. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Anybody else wants to ask a question? Um, well, if not, I'll say we thank Igor again. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Uh, so I guess I have yeah. to stop recording somehow. Yes. Just, uh, stop recording.